Okay, so today is April 9th, GDP 110, and today we're going to go over, let's see, what week are we in? We are in week 12. So we're going to go over a new assignment, and it's actually a quick assignment, and then you guys actually have an opportunity for another thing of extra credit. Um, and then we're going to do a brief lecture on the illusion of motion and print. Um, I want you guys to start thinking now, because we're getting really close to the end of the semester. I need you guys to start thinking about your final portfolios. Okay? So we talked about this at the beginning of the semester. Oh, great. Now it's broken. Can you find me that um, portfolio page under Vicky's site? This is I just have it in my sidebar, but then. So we've been creating a bunch of different graphics throughout the semester. And I want you guys to start kind of thinking about how you best want to encapsulate those designs as a portfolio. So I've said from the beginning, you guys have the option of doing either a print or an interactive InDesign document for your uh, final portfolio. We've already done two different exercises in which you guys have created the interactive elements in InDesign. So those are the beginning stepping stones to get you to be able to do that portfolio. We have an assignment that's going to be coming up called, and it's next week, it's called Telling a Story with Line. And in this particular assignment, you guys will be given um, a much more robust, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Interaction with the interactive elements in InDesign. So you will be telling a story with line utilizing those interactive elements. And it's kind of a good way to get your feet wet with, with doing the interactive portfolio if you're interested. If you want to do a printed portfolio, I want you guys to think about um, the same things for interactive. So you want to think about table of contents, organization of your pieces. You want to think about a theme that you want to have running through everything. Um, one of the things that... Uh, One of the things that's going to be helpful for you, and I think maybe I'll just open this up so you guys can start to look at the final weeks because we're coming up really close to the end of the semester. We really only have a month left, so it's going to be pretty fast. Um, so you have to think about the organization of your content, okay? How easy it is to navigate. Does it make sense to go from one page to the next? Are you going to have a table of contents? Are you going to have page numbering or a timeline? Um, and then you want to have content that's going to keep people interested page through page. So in this case, you're going to be showcasing your work that you've been doing over the course of the semester. But the idea is, do you want to also showcase your process and write about what your process was for each different assignment? How do you plan on having a consistency in those pages as you um, move throughout your portfolio? And that can be a printed page or that can be an interactive page. It's up to you. Um, and you also have to have an original concept and use of the materials and images in your piece. So for your final portfolio, think of a theme. You know, um, a student last year did a lot of yoga stuff. So that was kind of her theme running through, is that she did uh, what, tons of yoga and meditation-centric design pieces, pieces with Buddha and yoga poses. So then her whole book was tied together, she did a printed uh, portfolio, was tied together with those imagery. And, it would tie from cover to inside pages. The fonts were consistent, things like that. She found like a really cool yoga font where it's actually like human bodies would be in poses to be, you know, um, uh, the letters. And so she used that sparingly to add little elements of interest on each of her pages. And then you have to think about the consistency of your layout. So if you have each page and you have your um, uh, process on one side and you have your final on the other page, you know, make sure that's consistent throughout. Because when you're looking through a book, you want to have that consistency because it helps set up the reader to understand what's coming next. But you can be creative. I just want you guys to make sure that it's consistent in a way that makes sense for your 
uh, portfolio. Um, and also think about a professional presentation. If you are going to do a printed portfolio, you need to think about how you're going to bind your portfolio together. What kind of paper you're going to print your cover on. How you plan on having your pages be. You have to think about the printing process. You want to print front and back on your pages. You don't want to have it be a blank page up against another page. So when people flip through, all they're seeing is a blank page next to their other page. Think about it in spreads, okay? So those are the things that you have to kind of think about. And then if you're doing the interactive portfolio, you have to um, consider the, uh, the presentation of the timing of your animations, how long things take to move through. You know, we did a little bit of animations in the Andy Warhol exercise. You can apply those kind of animations to your interactive portfolio if that's what you want. But think about how that affects the person that's viewing your portfolio. If it takes 45 seconds for a butterfly to like fly across your page before anything loads, it's no one's going to interact with it. It's suddenly it looks like it was done without any thought process and, and the end user actually reading it. Okay. What was it that you couldn't find that you got the full for? I don't know. It was, um, it had a bunch, I think it may have been this page, but it had a bunch of um, examples of portfolios on it. Oh, and one of them, 404 on you? Yeah. And I have it, I have a link in the sidebar of, of Moodle. That's everything I tried to come up. So I want you guys to start thinking about this now because time management is a huge part of this class and making sure that you guys are giving yourselves enough time to do this. This project is very time consuming and I want you guys to start thinking about it now. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we are in this class, we're learning about all of the basics and elements for design, but it's also about understanding how to define a message and how to communicate, you know, that message visually. And you guys each have kind of found like a little niche, maybe it's something that is consistent throughout all of your pieces, or, um, and maybe that's something that you hang on to and continue to use that in your, in your messages. So start thinking about that now. So I am going to open this up. I don't get any portfolios. In this right here. This one. The other thing that I mentioned in the beginning of this semester is that I'm doing things a little bit differently this year and I'm actually going to bypass the actual day of the final. Because what we usually do is we have the portfolio due and then it's due that day and people don't really stay for class all that long. And then we meet again the following week and we do our presentation. Now I'm going to ask that you guys turn your portfolio in before class on the last day of the actual class day. And then we're going to do our presentations on that day. And so then we don't actually have to meet for the day of the final. So that's cool. So we're kind of finishing a little bit early. On your um, link, there's a capital D in the URL. If you change it to lowercase, it will resolve. Okay, cool. Can you do that? Can you make that edit? Right there. Oh, perfect. Okay, so let me... Just go ahead and click on it. And... Okay, I will. Hold on. I want it to change. There we go. This makes it easier. This is how you guys see it. Okay, so let's look at the next few weeks of class here. So today you're going to get um, an assignment. This assignment is an animation assignment. You're going to learn how to make an animated GIF. And basically what you're doing is the equivalent of an exercise, but you get the points for a studio project. Does that make sense? So I'm going to give you high level points for a very simple exercise. Cool, right? Okay. But the only thing is, is that it's due in one week, like a normal exercise. So make sure you have it done. And I'll go over that in a little bit. So then the following week we have another lecture and we have an assignment called Telling a Story with Line in which you guys are going to be using much more interactive elements and this is going to be a prep if you wanted to do an interactive portfolio. Start thinking about 
whether or not you want to do a printed or interactive portfolio. Then we have week 14. We are not going to have a guest speaker. Week 14 is when you're going to be assigned your final portfolio project. Okay, So then you have the following week to work on that only. Then on May 7th, this is going to be our final day of class, this is when your portfolio is due at 5 o'clock, and then you're going to present in class. So um, on April 30th, I want you guys to be prepared to spend the entire five hours in class. Because if you have something that you need to work on for your portfolio, this is your opportunity, your last opportunity to get feedback and help from us. We have the ability to bind here in the um, little DAC lab in the teacher room. The only way to bind is a spiral bind. Can I actually use, can I grab a pen? Yeah. So it's essentially something like this, where it's a plastic spiral bound. It's not very sexy, right? Or really all that creative, but it is an option. So if you wanted to do a printed piece, you could bind it with a spiral binder. And I can show you how to do that. And that would be a good opportunity to do that that week. Yes, Sean? The index also has instructions on how to use it. Yes. It's, and I can show you too. It's really, it's quite simple. Um, the other thing um, is if you, can, if you come to class that day and you want to assemble something or maybe you want to glue something or maybe you just want to work on your digital pieces and then print um, uh, elsewhere or you can have an opportunity to print in class, just come to class with an idea already established and the basis of that work already kind of set. Because if you're just now working on your portfolio, the one week before it's due, it, it's a little, yeah, it's a little sketchy. You're going to need more time than that. And I know this from experience with other students. Okay? So I try to make this glaringly obvious. Final project is due May 7th at 5 p.m. No late portfolios are accepted. If you do not have it turned in on time, you will not get graded. This is a standard protocol across all of the classes. And unfortunately, I've had a student who was very confused and thought that the neon orange type in bold was ignorable. Um, that sucked for him. So, let's see. What else do I want to talk about? Are you going to make that link available? Yeah, I just opened it now. Oh, so each week is open. So you guys can start to look ahead. Because we, one, two, three, four. We only have four weeks left. That's going to fly by. It's going to be so sad. No, you guys aren't going to be sad. <laughs> They're like, whoo, summer. They're representing on the seven, right? Mm-hmm. Blue says they're implementing on the fourth. Which blue? Over here? Yeah, that's old. Oh, yeah, let me fix that. Thank you. Yeah. Emily, you're just catching me every time. <laughs> let me fix it right now. So, just to clarify, though, if you do a print portfolio, you don't have to turn in you at the point, or you still do? You still do. Okay. You know how we do, like, um, let me show you an example, actually. Let me fix this first. All right, let me see. For your printed portfolio, what you have to do is turn in a PDF like this, where it actually um, is very similar to the documents that we do for um, our normal assignments. You know, so you'll have a cover and you'll have the information, but it will it will be your printed portfolio as PDF pages. But you also have to include a photo of your final bound piece. So in this case, this is what it looks like. 
for the student. But when you scroll through the pages, this is also the pages of the, of the portfolio. The reason why I have you do this is because when you present it in class, I want you to be able to take it home with you. And so I have something to review at home and I don't have to take your final por portfolio and make it difficult to get it back to you. But I will look, at, look it over in class when you present just to look at things like how it's bound, how professionally it's put together, you know, make sure that you don't have like glue marks and tape and it's like a, a mess, you know, I want it to look nice. So this student used a theme of like, you know, kind of an organic plant theme kind of running through all of the different pages, tied in with a lot of the stuff that they um, actually designed. See a lot of organic um, shapes and plants and animals. And then again, that ties in to the cover. So in this case, this student decided to bind it using um, screws and, what is that? What are these things called? Wing nuts. Wing nuts with wood. Found a piece of really pretty uh, rice paper that had flower petals pressed into it and was able to incorporate that. So when it laid over her really simple cover design, it all tied in. So that's an option. So here's another student's work, okay? So you can see they thought about what would this look like bound? Um, how would the spiral binding work with um, the edge of the um, document? You always want to give yourself like a half an inch of space past uh, where you think you would because of the way that the spiral binder works. But in this case, the spiral bound look matches this kind of sporty um, look of this portfolio. Okay, so you see the front cover and the back cover. You have your table of contents, and there's page numbers and a theme that ties through. And these are just like so cute, these little illustrations. And so you can see like his dog and hunting was a huge influence in um, his stuff, so he continued that theme. Here's his dog right here. So you guys can pull stuff like that out of your work. And there's the back cover. Okay. So then here's an example of an interactive portfolio. And this is what you can do utilizing the interactive portfolio options in InDesign. So you know how we did um, the, but we made buttons in the different exercises. So if you click the button to go left or right, you could click through that multi-object, um, multi-state object. Well, you could click that button and hit skip, and it would skip the animation process. And then each of these are a button. And what this does is it either opens up a window and it closes it down. Or the idea is you could click on the different creatures, okay? Right here, buttons, multi-object, multi-state object, right? Click through. We did this. Easy. It looks like it's pooping. Huh. <gasps> That's so funny. It's like jelly beans. Mm-hmm. Right, so you guys can see how it all works. When we do the story with line, you will be able to become a little bit more familiarized with this process. Yeah? It just says on the side of that entire portfolio, if the output through an Adobe Edge and be uh, visible on iPads and Windows desktops. That's cool. Anything. Today. Today. Okay, so here's another example, and this one's cute because it's giving you instructions on what to do. So you always want to think about user interaction and usability. So if it was just this tree, would we know that we would need to click and roll over those? Maybe not. So it's telling you what to do, and then you roll over, and it's giving you a glimpse of what is happening. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this. This is a two-page layout. And so they took a creative <laughs> route in showcasing it. And then you would go to exit. Let's see this one. So you can see for this example, you don't necessarily have to have your process involved with your portfolio, but it's something to think about. If your process was a huge part of your learning experience here and how you um, came to end up doing your final pieces, maybe you have that in. Maybe you showcase your sketches. You can make it as um, uh, personalized as you want. But you need to have all of the assignments in there. Hi, Liam. Sorry for being late. Um, is this for the final, is this the final project? This is the final portfolio. Cool. And so just having you guys start thinking about it now. Do you want it to be interactive? It can either be interactive or it can be printed. Cool. Okay. And I'm, I haven't officially assigned this to you yet, but I want you to start thinking about what you want. Do you want it to be printed? Do you want it to be interactive? And what your theme is going to be and how you're going to carry that out because this is going to be due very quickly. We only have a month left of class. So just, I already said this to everybody, but we're, we don't meet for the final. We turn everything in at 5 o'clock on May 7th, and then we present in class, and that is our last day. Okay. And you cannot turn it in late. Okay, other note. How many of you have outstanding assignments or um, you've resubmitted assignment for a higher grade that I have not yet graded? Okay. If you have a grade, if you turn something in on time, okay, and you want to resubmit it for a higher grade, you need to do that soon. So in our syllabus, there were two cutoff dates for submitting. Um, stuff for a new grade. I'm going to pull this up. Okay, so if you had a, an assignment that you turned in between weeks one and seven and you didn't like the grade and you wanted to resubmit it, you had until week nine. I'm going to be a little flexible and say that if you have that, you can have until next week to turn that in. Then you only have until, let's see, the end of week 14 to turn in your remaining assignments. We are currently in week 12. Yes, Liam? So week 10 to 13, you can redo and turn in by 14? Yes. Okay. The reason why we cut it off on week 14 is because I have to regrade everything and make sure everything is processed and I don't want people turning things in the day before, which has literally happened. I've had students be like, can I turn in seven projects? And I'm like, no, it's the, everything, it's the last day of class. No, don't make, don't make me do that. I don't, I don't like saying mean things. Actually, maybe. It was not all that much. Yeah, seriously. Oh, let's see. Okay. All right. So let's do a brief lecture. And I don't know what you're doing. Why isn't this working? Start refreshing. Set to uh, <clears throat> Apple. What do you mean? It's just Chrome doesn't seem to go that way. Okay. Let me open Safari or something else. No, Firefox. Okay, it might be an MOV file.
Okay, we're going to watch a short video. It's a video that is made with um, stop motion animation, and it's all typographical. And it's just kind of a fun video to show you guys what you can do with type beyond just writing should copy. Probably pause it. Before. Should we pause it? Okay. <clears throat> so you can create the illusion of motion in many different ways. Okay? And in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about type specifically, but you can kind of um, utilize these same concepts to any kind of image. And the reason why we're talking about this is because sometimes you want to create a little bit more of um, the experience of um, movement for your next assignment, which is your animation movement, because you're going to um, animation uh, GIF, because you're going to have limited. Um, ability to utilize actual animation. So maybe you want to take some of these um, ideas here and utilize those to create more of a, an animated look. We also have our story with line that's coming up and you may want to have um, the idea of motion be more of a, a printed look. So if you think about illusion of motion using type or any other kind of graphic, if you think of um, something moving away from a central axis, that kind of creates tension and calls a little bit of um, attention to the design, which creates the illusion of motion. So if you were to have type that's, um, say, italicized and it's kind of leaning to the right, you could utilize that to create like the feeling of motion or something moving. Because um, you think about you know, the force as you move forward um, in a car, you're kind of pushed back a little bit. Same thing can be utilized with type. So anything um, that's kind of leaning, uh, whether it's an image or italic type, gives the illusion of, mo of uh, movement. Again, if you have stuff moving away from a central axis, if you have a piece, uh, like, like an image in the center of your format, and you have stuff that's kind of moving away from that, maybe like a sunburst or you have lines. I know in Lydia's um, uh, tutorial, she talks about, you know, you have like those lines that you created and how you broke them up in those um, directional lines that were moving away from an object help to create that illusion of motion. Um, and then if you have type that you've moved off an imaginary horizon line and it's kind of spread around the page, that also creates the illusion of movement. Because when you move type off of a horizon line or off of like a set baseline, um, what happens is, just like with any other design, if you were to do that as well, you have a natural path that your eye kind of follows around your piece. And so when your eye moves around the piece, you can automatically start to capture kind of the illusion of, of motion that way. Um, so this is a little blurb here. When designing a magazine or book interior, the designer has the opportunity to move text and images through space. As the reader turns each page, uh, there is the opportunity to surprise. So unlike a static poster like a uh, book uh, jacket or poster or any of those things, pages can function in the same way that film does over time and space. So you can build tension and kind of unfold and create a story with that motion by engaging somebody in, in, a, in a book. So you guys can do the same kind of idea with your portfolio. If you want to draw somebody through a story, you can think about a way to um, kind of do that page by page as the reader kind of turns through your pages. Um, and then you can also establish the illusion of motion by setting up a repeated pattern and then breaking that form. Um, because we tend to read from right to left, and if we have a similarity, we see something that's um, uniform, kind of break out of that, it causes us to pay attention and focus on that more. Okay, so shape can also contribute to the illusion of motion. If you move away from symmetry or you have kind of odd shapes, um, it will bring the reader's eye around the page. Um, a perfect example would be something like, where's my little pen? Would be something like the placement of a shape close to the edge of your page. So if you have somebody that's facing this way and looks, it has the illusion that he's going to walk off this page, then you kind of ha have that feeling of motion as well. Same thing can be said if you have some somebody facing this direction, how does that affect the illusion of motion? Is this person going to be walking in that direction? 
So placement on the page and kind of how you utilize shapes um, also can add to that. Okay, cropping. So that's kind of what we talked about there. If you crop something in, you crop somebody close to the, the edge, you can get a, achieve that sense of motion. And then the next is sequencing. So if you have um, a sequence like this image here of this boy jumping, these are all static images that are capturing motion. But you can see how the sequence translates into motion. Okay. And then last but not least, we have kinesthetic response. So it's the science of movement. And when we kind of engage with a piece and kind of imagine what the movement is like, then we can um, tend to base our experiences around that and say, okay, this is a moving object. So we can kind of compare to what our personal experiences are to an image. So there's a lot of different ways that you guys can kind of capture motion. We're going to be creating an actual animated GIF in this class using Photoshop. And for this assignment, this is what you're going to be doing. A little rocket ship. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple, and you're going to love me. Because all you're going to do is follow step-by-step -step instructions to recreate this. So, Liam, you missed this part, but this is like an exercise, and it's due in one week but you get the points of a full studio project for this. Cool. I'm also giving you the opportunity to do extra credit and create your own original animated GIF for 10 points, okay? So I'm gonna, let's do this together. Yeah. So this, uh, what is it called, the Bluebeard thing? Is that only one day, because that's, I have my class that, yeah. that Monday, so is that's it like a one it's a one-time thing. Sorry, I'm being on. Okay, so what you guys are going to do is you're going to open up this page with these step-by-step -step instructions. Step-by-step. -step. Beep, bop, boop, boop, boop. You're going to download the example animation PSD. And you're just going to follow the instructions to create it. Well, that is loading. Let me show you your extra credit. Okay, so you're going to take all of the skills that you've learned from this little rocket ship exercise and you're going to create your own animation using your own original artwork, illustrations, or photography. Okay, it's due by one week from today, okay, by five o'clock. What's it? No, I need to change that date that it's on. So here are some examples of animations that previous students have made. Fun, right? So I want you guys to be creative with that. Okay, so you're going to open up this uh, PSD that's on that page. And what I want you to do is go to Window and go to... We have a ton of videos there we go. On, this, Timeline. on this particular lecture. Yes, you are right. Okay, so you go to video and you go to timeline. And you want to make sure it's in this format. Can you see how this looks down here in the very bottom? Yeah. Window, video, timeline. Window, timeline. Oh. I called it a video timeline. 
So how, I'm gonna show you guys how to do this. It's really easy. So you wanna make sure that all of the elements to your animation are created before you start the animation process. So that means that you guys have to storyboard and think about how you want your animation to be. Okay, not just, not, not for this, but for your extra credit. Okay, so you have to think about, okay, how am I gonna have this set up? What's gonna move first? How many elements do I need to move? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off all of these layers. So you see how all of the different animations are on different layers. So I'm just gonna turn off the eye of everything but the rocket ship, okay? So everything is turned off except for the rocket ship. Then I'm going to create a new timeline frame, okay, by clicking this button right here. And you can see that we've duplicated these frames. Now what you want to do is apply one animation to this frame. So what you can do is then we want to turn on, let's see, three. Then I'm going to duplicate it again. And I'm going to turn on two. And then I'm going to duplicate it again. And I'm going to turn on one. I'm going to duplicate it again, and I'm going to turn on launch, duplicate it again, turn on the flame, and then I'm going to duplicate it again, and this time I want my rocket to actually launch. So I'm going to take both the flame and the rocket, hold down shift and select both of those layers, and I'm going to move them up. So now this is where you apply something called tweening. And tweening looks at the um, first frame and the second frame that you have next to each other. And it's going to fit in what it thinks you want happening based upon the changes of those elements in those frames. It's really kind of genius. So you select both of those. I'm going to hold down shift. And then I want to... Go to, oh yeah, this little um, side menu here, and you want to go to tween. And then you can choose however many frames you want to add in between. We're just, let's add five for now. Okay. And see, now it suddenly plopped five different frames in, and it looked at where everything was, and it based it on in between those two, okay, of where that would be moving in time. So right now we have it set to one second each. Let's just, let me show you what that looks like. Yeah, so I'm going to hit this play button right here and it's going to play this for you. <laughs> so maybe you can do one second for these instances, right, these first few frames. And then these frames here, I'm going to hold down shift, and I'm going to select the drop down arrow, it says one second, and I'm just going to go ahead and say 0.2 seconds, we can see what that is. Now it's going to apply 0.2 seconds to just these end frames, I'm going to hit play. Maybe we do, let's see. How did you get to the tween thing again? This like little drop down right here. Should we make a rocket faster? I finally saw Interstellar, so I feel like this needs to be like time warp speed. What did you think of it? It was weird. <clears throat> it was cool though. I think I would have enjoyed it more if I had more about like the consequences. No, I don't think so. Because if you did, you'd probably be like, no, <laughs> really? this is wrong. I actually do. I heard it. No, I know. I heard it. It was pretty. It kind of freaked me out a little bit. That part where he's like, I don't understand the part where he's like stuck in that realm and like watching his body. Yeah, I know. But you know what freaked me out more than that was that blue and black dress thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh yeah. 
No, no, yeah. Okay, so does that seem pretty simple? Yeah. Okay, so let me show you guys what you can do then if you wanted to create kind of a fun animated GIF on your own. So let's do a new one. A good subject for that would be Sisyphus. Sisyphus. The guy that pushes the rock up the hill and then comes back down and pushes it up. Oh. Wait, that's really complicated to illustrate in a short amount of time, sir. Okay, let me show you this. So see how I opened up a new document? See how my video timeline thing looks different than this one here? Notice this, I opened this document and it went to that, but when I open a new document, this changed. What you want to do is you want to click this button right here. Hold on, I need to actually have something on, like a frame, something in the frame, I think. Right? No, why is it doing that? John. Oh, create video timeline and then click that. Back up. <coughs> Do that again. Create video timeline and then hit this button here, bottom left hand corner. Boom. Okay. So, like I said before, you want to make sure you have all of your animation, all of the things that you want to animate, already animated, and different moving parts on different layers. So let's just do something really simple here. I'm going to do, oops, that's not what I wanted, I wanted to go, that was not the tool that I wanted. Let's do a little orange kitty. There's my base kitty kitty, right? New layer, kitty's tail. New layer two. I'm just making sure I'm doing this on a new layer each time. Kitty's tail. Kitty's tail. Let's do another layer. Let's do kitty paw. Kitty paw, kitty paw, and then on this other layer we'll have kitty leg, and then we'll have another kitty leg that moves. Okay, so it seems like a lot of stuff happening, but you have to do it like this. You have to think big picture what's going to move. So now let's turn off everything that we don't. We need that leg. We need one tail. Let's see, where's my kitty? There it is. Yes, Liam. Instead of clicking the layers when you're like selecting them for the timeline, can you just select the actual designs in the box and you can do that in graphic? Yeah, so if you have like your arrow set to auto select, if you click something, then it will turn it on like that. You guys know that? Probably not. So if you have it auto selected, then when you, if you click on an area, it will automatically select that particular layer. All right, so I'm going to click the tail and then. But that won't select something that's turned off. No. But the idea is that you want to make sure that you. I'm going to turn this off right now because the idea is you want to turn on only the eyes in your layers so it's just easier this way. If you, okay? Okay, so here's our kitty. New frame, turn off that kitty tail, turn on that kitty tail. New frame, turn off that kitty tail, turn on that kitty tail. New frame, turn on that kitty tail, turn off that kitty tail. New frame, turn that one off. New frame, leg, turn off this leg. New frame. That one on, this one on. All right, let's just see. Right now it's set to five seconds. That's way too long. We're going to give our kitty, let's do half a second and see what happens. Oh, hey, little kitty. 
<laughs> Yay! So it's pretty fun, right? So you guys can be really, really creative. If you wanted to, you could even say, do the idea of like having your kit, kitty like move off the frame. But just know, let me show you what happens. If I do another frame, and then I take my kitty, and I move kitty. Yeah, let's just, let's do something else. Let's move kitty's tail. If I move kitty's tail, and then I hit play, sometimes what happens is kitty's tail may mess up somewhere down in this timeline area. Or if you go back and you say, no, I need to move this tail a little bit here. Oh, let's see now what else happened. <laughs> so it's I'm not I'm not doing a very good job of recreating when havoc happens, but sometimes if you move something around too much that you've already animated, you're gonna like it's gonna become very very complicated to fix. Okay, so let's undo and get our kitty back. Oops, my hair! I gotta set this up. Window history. Okay. So then what you do is you go to File, and you save it for the web. No, or we're going to do it, we're actually going to do it as an animated um, GIF, or GIF, whatever you prefer. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save it. And you can see here, it gives you drop down options, okay, so make sure GIF is selected. And think about it like, um, uh, so when you think about when you're saving something for print versus web, you have to think like big picture. So it's not just the file type that you're saving it to, but it also um, the um, color profile. So if you have something that you're working for in print and you save it as a JPEG and then you try to upload that to the web, colors can be messed up. Okay, resolution can be messed up. So think about... Um, whenever you're going to make something for the web, you want to go to File, Save for Web, and then select something because it will automatically adjust those color profiles and things for you. Okay, so I'm going to save it, and I'm going to call it Kitty. So you could place this animated GIF now on to a website. Um, you could put it in, I don't know, all the cool kids are playing with animated GIFs these days. So what you can do then is we're going to go to, where did I save it? Documents. Nope, work. Yeah. We're going to find kitty. And I'm just going to click and drag my kitty GIF right into an empty browser window. Oh, there's Kitty! That's so good. How do you get it to keep looping? Oh, that's, thank you. So you can set it to loop right here. Three times forever in this little drop down. So you can reverse the frames too and have this continuously loop so that it makes sense instead of jumping back to the beginning. Yeah. So if you're going to have it continuously loop, think about, yeah. Kind of looks like he's dancing a little bit. Fancy kitty. <laughs> <laughs> so have fun with that. And I think that everybody here should do the extra credit because it's fun. And it's good practice. So in real world instances, you know, I use animated GIFs for web banners for work. That's primarily what I what I end up doing. Um, let me see if I can find an example. Maybe not one that I've done, but so we'll do paid online ads that will run sometimes on NewsHawk, and you can make these animated gifs, and then they can rotate, like right here. This little thrift store truck that's moving. Do you prefer those over Flash now? Um, I, they're easy to do. I don't have Flash on my computer at work, 
so it's simple, easy to translate. And plus, it works on iOS. Plus, it works on iOS. Plus, most of the people that we send it to, like they know what to do with it. So, yeah. Another plug here for Edge Animate. Mm -hmm. You can make some really cool stuff using Edge Animate, as good as Flash will be. Cool. Okay. Do you guys have any questions for today? So let's do our critique of um, the two-page layouts that you guys have. And Liam, you missed this, but um, there was a little snafu in the deadline. Did you turn in your two-page layout? Okay. So I accidentally had it set to be due like the 23rd or something. So some people rushed to get it done because they thought they had more time. Um, so we're going to have do a critique today, and then if you guys want to do changes to it, and re-upload it by next week, then you have an opportunity to make those changes before, and it won't be considered late.